is forever. So today's passage is uh, Luke 7, starting from verse 36 to the end of the chapter, and then uh, 8 to 3. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, as weeping his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this is a, if man were a prophet, he would who, touching him, was the kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denaria and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this that who even forgives sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. After this, Jesus travelled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and some, also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Curaza, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Last week we looked at the first half of chapter 7, which was about uh, faith. And we said last week that faith is something that you know, people often say, don't they? Oh, I wish I had your faith. As if it's some kind of quality which we have um, inside of us that other people uh, don't necessarily have. I wish I had your uh, faith. But do you not think that often people, when they think about faith, and I think probably maybe predominantly in our society, when people think about faith, what they really think about is that it is something which is really just irrational. No, a leap into the dark. When there's when when evidence ends and you kind of just take the step out into into nothingness. It's irrational. And I think even when sometimes people say to us, No, I wish I had your faith, what they are really thinking is to themselves is, Well, I wish I could have your faith, but I but I, I just can't be so irrational. I, I, can't, I can't believe in something which is not there. Because nobody wants to do that, do they? They don't want to believe in something which is not true. Or as some people would say, I don't want to believe in fairy stories. But in a sense, that is to misunderstand what faith is in the Bible. You see, in the Bible, faith is not about this leap into the dark. It's not about something irrational. It's about something uh, which uh, we do on the basis of evidence. In fact, faith, the word really just means trust, dependence, or reliance. And so faith in the Bible is trust, reliance, dependence, not on ourselves, but on Jesus, the man of history. And so far from being irrational, faith is based on who Jesus is. It is trust, it is reliance, it's dependence on him. And in this passage, we're going to continue thinking about what faith is. It started last week, because do you remember what we saw last week? There was the, the centurion, his servant was, is ill, and he sends to Jesus to come and to heal him. And in response to what happens in the story, Jesus says, I've not seen such faith 
even amongst the people of Israel. And we saw last week that the faith that that centurion had wasn't faith in himself. The Jews said, well, come and help this man. He is worthy. But the man said, no, I'm not worthy. I don't even, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my roof. He didn't look to himself, but actually he looked at Jesus and says, but I can see in you one in whom I can trust, who can say the word and my servant will be healed. His faith looked to Jesus. He trusted in Jesus. He depended on Jesus at the same time as he knew he couldn't rely on himself. And faith comes up again in today's passage. So if you look at, at verse 50, Jesus says to this woman that Keith read about to us, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In this woman, we find another example of what faith is. In this instance, it has to do with the fact that she had her sins forgiven by Jesus. She had trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of her sins. And more specifically, what we learn about faith here is what faith looks like. Now, when somebody has their sins forgiven, what does their faith look like is what we see in this uh, passage. Now, now, notice the setting in verse 36. Jesus has been invited by a Pharisee to go for a meal, and so Jesus goes for this meal. We find out a little bit later the, the Pharisee is called Simon. And so Jesus accepts the invite. He goes to the table, and he is reclining at Simon's uh, table. And you might think, oh, that's very nice, isn't it? I quite like going out for meals. You know, I like going out for meals at people's houses and you sit down and you have good food and you're chatting around uh, the table. And that's what's happening here. Jesus with uh, Simon and his friends at this meal. But then the, the story goes on and we find out that there's someone else who lives in that area who finds out Jesus is there and she prepares herself to come and see Jesus. It turns out she's met Jesus before. We don't know when she's met him before, but she's met Jesus uh, before. She's had an encounter with him. And we find out as we go through the story that she had her sins forgiven at that time. You see why that is significant in verse uh, 37. It was because she had lived a sinful life. And we don't know what her sinful life was. But she's done things in her life. That means Luke here describes her as a sinful woman. She's lived a sinful life, done things which made her well known with people around her, but not in a good way. There's some kind of uh, failure in her life that everyone knew about. It often happens. You can see how it happens, can't you? People in a community get a reputation for something that they have done. Now, it might have been some kind of terrible crime. We don't know what it is that she had done. Or maybe just a reputation that she earned for the way she lived. But you can see how it happens, can't you? People in the town, everybody knows, oh, do you remember what she did back in the day? And it feels sometimes, isn't it, that we, we feel better when we can point to other people and say, oh, do you know that person? At least I'm not like them. And we find that Simon the Pharisee, he also knew about this uh, woman. He knew her reputation. And he is surprised that Jesus would allow such a woman to come near him. Look what he's thinking in verse uh, 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Simon the Pharisee here, he is shocked by Jesus. Shocked that Jesus would allow this kind of woman to touch him. I don't know if you, people watched them, it's a bit old, old kind of, quite a long time ago, watched them, Downton Abbey. You watch Downton Abbey? Watch Downton Abbey? Do you know in Downton Abbey there was one, one episode where one of the um, characters, Mrs. Crawley, in, in, employs uh, a woman to come and work in her house. And you find out that this woman has, was an ex-prostitute and she's come to work in Mrs. Crawley's house. And people are appalled by how could she do this? 
And so Carson, the butler in the big house, he says to the rest of the staff that they mustn't go near that house or associate with anybody from the house. They don't want to be tarnished by this situation. That's, that's, that's Simon the Pharisee's view. That's what he's kind of thinking is going on here. That Jesus would be defiled by this kind of woman. And so here's this woman who comes. She's met Jesus. She's touching Jesus. Simon is appalled by it. But this woman comes. She comes because she's, Jesus had told her at some point in the past, your sins are forgiven. And she's believed him. And it has changed her life. It's not that people have stopped looking down on her. They're still shunning her. They're still excluding her. But she knows her sins are forgiven and so she prepares to come and meet Jesus. And do you see what she, she does? She comes uh, prepared and she's brought this uh, alabaster jar of perfume so that she might be able to anoint Jesus with it. Uh, she stands uh, behind Jesus there in verse 36 and she is uh, weeping. So many tears that she could wet his feet. And then she it lets her hair down. That in itself may have been a shocking uh, thing in the culture. And she wipes Jesus' feet with her uh, hair. She's kissing his feet. And she's pouring perfume over his uh, feet. Even though she's been shunned. Even though she knows everybody's looking at her. Even though she knows everybody's kind of whispering around. She'd probably hear it, wouldn't she? Everybody whispering about what's going on. Seeing everybody's shock, but she wants to come to see Jesus. Simon himself, we find he's not just shocked, but he, well, his reasoning goes further. He just thinks, well, if Jesus was really special, if he was really a prophet, as people are saying, well, then he wouldn't allow such a woman to touch him. He would know, and he would take himself away. You see, he sees Jesus allowing this woman to do something which is so intimate. And he thinks, well, Jesus can't possibly be anybody really special. That's what Simon is thinking, really. And he's dismissing Jesus. And you know, and that reaction starts to get at something of the point of this passage. This woman, at some point in the past, she's listened to Jesus. She's trusted in him. She's relied on him. She's heard those words, your sins are forgiven, and she's believed them. And as a result, she's shown devotion to Jesus, love to Jesus. Simon the Pharisee, on the other hand, well, he is someone who's maybe outwardly showing, I don't know what you would say, a respect for Jesus. But we find on the inside he is rejecting Jesus. It says Jesus said about the Pharisees back in verse 30 that they reject God's purposes for themselves. They thought they were good enough. Simon thinks well, he can't be a prophet. But he misses the point that Jesus is far more than even a prophet. That he is the Messiah. The one who can come and forgive sins. You see, this woman has learned the lesson. She looks not to her own goodness. She's not thinking, how good am I? But she looks to the worthiness of Jesus, trusts in him, and responds to him with love. Simon has an outward concern and the appearance of concern of welcoming Jesus, but actually he doesn't love him. And while the woman is continuing at Jesus' feet, there's this dialogue between Jesus and Simon. It begins in verse 40. Jesus says, I have something to tell you, Simon. And he's, he's, uh, he's, you see in verse 40 begins, Jesus answered him. Simon's thinking in his head, but Jesus answers him. I love how Jesus does that. Do you know what I think mean? that's, that's a great, no, you're thinking things in your head and then Jesus answers him. <laughs> and Jesus is going to explode Simon's thinking. Simon condemns Jesus in his thoughts. And in his response, Jesus doesn't defend himself, but he explains what this woman is doing. 
And so he tells the straightforward parable, verse 40, 40, 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. And so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Now, it's quite easy to see, isn't it? Who will love more? The one who's had the biggest debt cancelled. The one who's been forgiven more. They will love more. And that's what uh, Simon says in verse 43. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus says. And he was right. But the bombshell really comes all the way down at verse 47. Where Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. See, Jesus is saying, this woman's response is a response of love because of the greatness of the debt that's been forgiven. And can you see what we learn then about Jesus? Jesus knows about and has forgiven her many sins. Do you see again in verse 47? She had many sins, and yet her many sins have been forgiven. That explains what's happening. And Jesus knows about those many sins. And her actions are a response to the forgiveness that Jesus had proclaimed. Notice, I think we can sometimes misunderstand this passage. It's not saying she has done this, therefore her sins are forgiven. It is saying her sins have been forgiven, therefore she is loving like this. You see, in the parable, the debt is forgiven, therefore who will love more? Her many sins have been forgiven, so she loves much. We're not told when her sins were forgiven. We don't know when Jesus said those words to her, daughter, your sins are forgiven. But that's what Jesus has been doing in the passage we've been looking at, haven't we? Over the weeks, we've seen Jesus proclaiming the year of God's favor. He says, it's, the, it's not, the, it's not the, um, the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Jesus did it for the paralyzed man. Do you remember the man who came down through the reef? And Jesus looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. Maybe she had been taken by her friends like the paralyzed man had been taken to hear Jesus. Maybe she'd, some of her friends said, come on, let's go and see Jesus. Maybe she was at the banquet that Levi threw. Do you remember they said there was tax collectors and loads of others there, lots of sinners there? Maybe she had been there and heard Jesus' words. Maybe she'd been like Peter. Do you remember Peter after that miraculous catch of fish? And Peter says, hey, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Maybe she'd said something different. I can't be in your presence, Lord. I'm sinful. Only to hear Jesus say, don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. And she believed Jesus, trusted in him. And that message, your sins are forgiven, is the message of the gospel that we hear too, isn't it? Now at the end of Luke, uh, Jesus said that now that he's suffered and he's risen from the dead, those things which had to happen, the next thing that was necessary was for repentance and for the forgiveness of sins to be proclaimed in the world. And it's the message which has come even to us here this morning. The very first sermon in Acts, uh, people are convicted of their sins and they ask Peter, what should we do? And he says this, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the gospel that's then come down uh, through the ages and from every generation since. You can have your sins forgiven in Jesus' name. There is hope because of what Jesus has done. You can have peace with God again. It says Timothy writes in his, uh, Paul writes to Timothy in, the, in his first uh, letter to Timothy. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. <laughs> 
But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul was saying, look, and I'm the worst of sinners. And so if God could show love and mercy to me, he can show it to you too. And you can have your sins forgiven. And do you see how that thought explodes Simon's reasoning? Simon thinks, well, Jesus has come. If he's important, if he's special, if he is some kind of representative from God, no, he wouldn't associate with sinners. He wouldn't have anything to do with someone like that. Yet not only was Jesus willing to interact with someone like that, he deals with the shame and the ugliness of sin. He doesn't just make friends with sinners. No, pat them on the back and say, it's it's all okay, we can probably get through it. No, he transforms them. He makes them new people. He brings life where there is death. You see, this woman shunned from society, it's just a little picture of what our sin does between us and God. It excludes us, causes a rift, a fracture. And yet Jesus comes and says, you can be welcomed back home. I can forgive your sins. You can be mine. But the second thing that we see is that forgiven sinners respond with gratitude and love to Jesus. You see, this woman's had our sins forgiven, and forgiven sinners then love much. Those who've been forgiven love much. This woman comes prepared to say thank you to Jesus, to show love to Jesus, devotion to Jesus for the wonder of what she's received, for sins forgiven. And the contrast is given by Jesus between Simon the Pharisee and this woman. Do you see it in verse 44? Jesus draws attention to this woman and exposes Simon's response in these few little questions and answers that he gives. He looks at the the, the woman and he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I think I've said before, I, I, I just love that. Because <laughs> I think, Simon's definitely seen this woman. Everybody in that room has seen this woman at Jesus' feet. But Simon's not really seen, has he? He's not really seen what's uh, going on. Here's a woman expressing gratitude and love to Jesus because she has grasped what Jesus came to do. That he is the Messiah who can forgive sins and she has trusted in him. And so Jesus contrasts uh, the love that she is showing with Simon's love. Verse 44, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you did not give me a kiss. But this woman has not stopped kissing my feet from the time I entered, he says. Simon, you did not put oil on my head, as would have been expected, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. You see the point that Jesus is making? It's Simon hasn't responded with love. He's responded maybe with indifference. Maybe not trying to deliberately snub Jesus. He's respectful. He calls Jesus teacher. He's invited him for a meal. But he's not showing the kind of love and devotion that this woman has shown And I think the point is clear, isn't it? Forgiven sinners love like this woman. They show radical love and devotion to Jesus. Jesus who is worthy, who is great, 
who, out, who is of infinite worth, who comes to call sinners, even you, to proclaim good news to sinners, a welcome home, that God's favor. You see, linked to this uh, love that the woman is showing here is a great humility, isn't it? So she's not concerned about herself and what she looks like. But she's just concerned with how great Jesus is. You see, humility is not placing ourselves too high in, in our own estimation, isn't it? It's placing ourselves down below and seeing how worthy Jesus is. And I think this is something we need to try and get to, to grips with. Because I think it's here in a way that things have gone wrong for Simon. Because I think when you, when you look, and I said in a moment ago that Simon respond, reacts to Jesus with indifference or certainly not love. But do you not think at, at first it, it, it might have looked like that? So he's, he's invited Jesus to come to a meal. He's provided now imagine that it's a meal in a Pharisee's house and they're all around this table and they've got really nice food in the middle and they've got conversation going on around. He knows about Jesus, so he must have been listening. Now he says, if this man were a prophet, that's what people have been saying about Jesus. So he knows about Jesus to a certain extent and he's invited Jesus to come. And I said before, it's nice to get invited to things, isn't it? It makes you feel special. But it wasn't love, was it? And sometimes we can do the same, I think. We can be like Simon. We can be religious. We can do things which maybe look like the right thing. But it's not really responding to Jesus and what he has given to us. And I think we can hear a passage like this and say, no, we should have love like this woman. So we think, right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to show love to Jesus as if then that's going to mean that God will show some kind of concern for us. Can you see the point? We end up becoming counterfeit love, thinking that we can do things to earn God's favor rather than seeing Jesus. And seeing Jesus is of such great worth and value that all I do is want to respond to him. It's not doing all those religious things and having a religious devotion which makes us think, well, now God might love me. It's about responding rightly to who Jesus is. You see, Jesus described the Pharisees back in verse 30 as those who rejected God's purpose for themselves. Now, they thought that they were good enough. Their actions were enough. And he doesn't humble himself to see in Jesus the one who can forgive sins, which is what he desperately needs. And then respond to him with a love and devotion from that. See, it's what the, the other um, guests say in verse 49. Who is this who even forgives sins? That's the question you have to come to grips with. Who is Jesus who would even forgive sins? See, I wonder whether that's a question that you ask. Do you know this Jesus who is able to forgive sins? The ones who says to us even this morning, your sins can be forgiven. Come to me. Jesus is the one who proclaims the year of God's favor, the one who proclaims a welcome back into God's family, even though you are a sinner and an enemy of God, who doesn't deserve anything from God's hand. Jesus says, come. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Sinners like me. Sinners like you. Sinners like me who mess up all the time. I know I don't deserve mercy and grace from God. I deserve God's rejection, judgment, and yet Jesus calls me home. Jesus who demonstrates that he has the power and authority to heal and to forgive sins. He's able to say to me, Peter, your sins are forgiven. 
Jesus, as we keep reading on through Luke's gospel, we find out goes to the cross and dies in my place so that my sins can be forgiven. Jesus who sends his spirit into the world so that that message of the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to the world and works in people so that they might receive that message. You see, the response is, what's your response to Jesus? Looking away from ourselves, seeing that he is worthy and he offers forgiveness for sins. You see, what is your response to Jesus? That's the, that's the real question. So why not take a moment just to reflect on that uh, for yourself? What's your response to Jesus? Do you love him because he's forgiven your sins? Do you look to Jesus and see one who has done everything so that you can be welcomed back home? Or are you more like Simon? Maybe doing things for Jesus thinking that you're loving him, but your love is not because of what Jesus has done for you, but because of what you might get from him. It's coming to church, just something that you do because it's the right thing, or because you're coming to meet with fellow forgiven sinners to worship and to praise and to delight in Jesus, our Savior who has loved us. Let's take just a minute in silence just to ponder that, maybe to pray. And then I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, your Son who came to this world, who proclaimed your love to us, that we can have our sins forgiven, that we can be welcomed back home, that we can have a hope of eternal life with you forever. Father, we're sorry that when we miss or lose sight of Jesus, and think it's about what we do which might earn our way into your favor rather than seeing that you've done it all for us in Christ. Father, may you change us, renew us to see just how great uh, the thing that you've done for us in Christ is so that it just wells up in us a response of love and devotion to you. And that we would be like this woman who showed such love to Jesus for what he had done for her. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.